Everyone has that one game or series that they've clocked like a bajillion hours into. For many, it's their favorite RPG or online multiplayer game, or maybe you've put hundreds of hours into your Minecraft server or 100%ing Breath of the Wild for the third time. For me, there's absolutely nothing that can devour my time like Animal Crossing. And as the 10th day since launch passed and my Switch profile went from looking like this to looking like this, I realized just how much time I was once again spending on it. This this is nothing new. I fall into this hole every time a new Animal Crossing game comes out. Over the course of my life, I have spent an insane amount of time with this series, from that very first one on GameCube all the way up to New Horizons 20 years later. And with Animal Crossing once again devouring every brain cell I have, I figured now's maybe a good opportunity to kind of channel that excitement while it's still fresh and make a video about the series. This is not going to be a review or a more critical look at the games like I usually do. I figured I'd just kind of talk about my experiences and memories with the games, uh, my general thoughts and opinions on each one, and why the series means so much to me. Starting, of course, with the very original. Animal Crossing for Nintendo GameCube. Does anybody remember that GameCube trailer DVD? It came with a bunch of trailers and commercials for upcoming games for GameCube, and there was a number of commercials for Animal Crossing that had all these people wearing these big mascot costumes. Kind of a weird way to advertise this thing, but I think this was my very first exposure to the series. Man, I remember it was so unlike anything else I played at the time, where other games had me going on a quest and fighting a bad guy and, I don't know, maybe saving the world. Here was a game that didn't have any of that. Instead, the game was about making friends, making money, and paying for the things in life that you wanted. Working towards home payments and completing a museum of bugs, fish, fossils, and paintings. And I think that really appealed to the part of me as a kid that enjoyed making characters simply move around in a non-action context. I remember walking around DK Island in DK64 or exploring Hyrule in Ocarina of Time just to enjoy the environment, not to fight enemies or complete objectives or anything like that, but just to hang out in a virtual space that I found interesting. Animal Crossing was a big scratch to that itch, but what made me so interested in the game to begin with was the pitch of it being a game that never ended. That's what my friends would tell me. This game never ends, it doesn't have an ending, you can play it forever. Without any finite goal in sight, I guess you could potentially play this game forever. And as a kid that only had access to a handful of games a year, I found that idea very appealing. But of course, the game isn't actually endless. Animal Crossing's end goal could arguably be simply paying off your house, or it could be when you collect every bug, every fish, and finish the museum. But even when you do finish those things, you can still continue to collect more furniture and wallpapers and stuff, and then customize your house in any way you'd like. So while you could technically run out of things to do, that would take an absurd amount of time. So, of course, I ended up spending hundreds of hours playing this, and it became my favorite game ever at the time. I actually almost did not buy this game as a kid. Uh, it would have been 2002, I think. I would have been in second grade. I was eight years old, and I was saving up my allowance for months and months to buy Animal Crossing. And I go into the game store with my mom to buy it, and then I see Rayman Arena on the shelf, and I got so excited that I saw a new Rayman game that I blew my allowance on it instead. Yeah, my idiot kid brain fell into that brand recognition trap. You know, when you buy something you recognize instead of going through and trying something new to you, that would end up being better. Luckily, though, I'd end up getting the game later that year, and I can tell you right now, I definitely played this a lot more than Rayman Arena. One thing that was really cool about Animal Crossing is how it came with its own memory card. The file size for an Animal Crossing save was a lot bigger than your typical Nintendo game. It doesn't come close to some other games that annoyingly made you buy one of those huge memory cards, but as far as first party stuff goes, it was a little bit more than usual, so Nintendo had the decency to package a card with it. The Japanese version also comes with a memory card, but they have a picture of Lloyd on it instead of Rover. My guess for this is because it being the first Animal Crossing game in the West, we didn't know what gyroids were yet, and to newcomers, that design would only make sense to the Japanese, it being based on Haniwa. So I'm assuming they opted out for a cute animal character instead, because that would be much more marketable over here. I don't know for sure, but that's my guess because that kind of makes sense. Now what made these memory cards so cool is that it was also how the game's multiplayer worked. A multiplayer alternating, I remember that's what the back of GameCube games called it. Games where you take turns playing instead of playing at the same time, something like Worms would have that thing in the back. If you plugged a friend's memory card into slot B, you were able to take the train to their town. Sometimes you might even run into Blanca, this character with no face, and you get to draw one on her. That was always one of those cool little fun easter eggs you could find 
in Animal Crossing that were just kind of there for no real reason. They don't serve the gameplay in any meaningful way. They're just there just because they're fun and cool. I never really did visit other towns that often. My friends and I did use it a lot for when we wanted to trade items though, which was made even easier by the ability to give items to your personal gyroid for sale, making this the only Animal Crossing where you can trade bugs and fish, as far as I know. And there's one of those weird little one-off features that was only in the first game. Lloyd, your personal gyroid. He'll save the game and do other functions for you too. Yeah, remember when you had to run all the way back to your house to save? What a pain in the ass that was. They made it just so you press the start button and do it right there and all games onward and that was so much better. The first game also had that island you could go to if you plugged in your Game Boy Advance into the GameCube. Man, I kind of miss when Nintendo had all of these weird bonus features for players that did that archaic hardware malarkey. But you know if they did that nowadays, you'd just get people whining, Nintendo just had to lock away features behind arbitrary paywalls, there's no way I'm gonna buy another device just to unlock- it's like whatever bro, like plugging in a Game Boy Advance to your GameCube and getting a bonus for it was like the coolest thing on the planet. Ooh, the e-reader, that's a whole can of worms in itself. I wasted 40 freaking bucks on that thing back when it was brand new, and I barely got any use out of it. It was that very same trailer disc that made me buy the wretched thing, too. That trailer made it look so cool! I still have tons of cards for it, too. A lot of Animal Crossing ones. There's a lot to talk about here, but that'll have to be its own video. Another time. One more thing that was only in the first game were those hidden NES games you could unlock. Man, I played so much of two-player balloon fight in Animal Crossing when I was a kid. Uh, there was a lot of different ones of these, and there were so many different ways to unlock them, too. Here's another thing I love about Animal Crossing. There's always so many different ways to get stuff. You could browse the shop for furniture, or you could do favors for your villagers and try your luck getting a reward. Or you could play games with villagers that built igloos in the winter. Oh my god, anybody remember how you could obtain that placeholder item that was not meant to be in the game this way? Yeah, dummy! There it is. A dummy in all caps. It kind of scared me as a kid. I had no idea what this thing was supposed to be or why it was in the game. It was it was like this weird, cryptic, bizarre, urban legend thing you could get. Uh, I mean, now I know it's just a placeholder accidentally left in there. Uh, that's why it doesn't show up in the catalog, but yeah, I, I don't know. I just love all of the mystery that was in Animal Crossing. How certain things are harder to find than others. The the rare fish, for example. Everybody wanted to catch a string fish. Oh my god, I, I just remember the first time I ever caught a string fish. It was during the exact same play session that and I made a villager's catchphrase, the word shit. Because I thought as a kid it was hilarious that I could make my Nintendo game say a swear word. But my sister ratted me out. She told my dad and he said that he better not see any swear words in the game because obviously it being an E-rated game, he'd know it was my doing and not the game's. So being a kid, I got scared. I didn't want to get in trouble. So I desperately tried to get that catchphrase change prompt to happen again by talking to them over and over and over. But after having no luck, I had to reset the game without saving resetting the catchphrase, and losing that string fish. I was so pissed off. Yeah, I was like so obsessed with this idea of finding that rare thing that nobody else could. At the time, we were super young. It was like 2003 or 2004 or whatever, so we didn't really think about looking stuff up on the internet yet. Instead, all we had were tall tales from the playground to learn how to get the coelacanth. Yeah, 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 you gotta get it in the ocean, but it only appears when it's raining. I remember my friend Robbie made up this whole story about a rare fish called the brown fish, a fish that apparently wore a Mario hat. It could only be caught in a certain acre on a certain day during a certain minute of a certain hour. Why would it be so specific? That makes no sense. Nintendo would never do that. But nah, we didn't question it. We were kids. We all believed that big long story on how to unlock Luigi after all. We believed it because it was interesting, because we wanted these ridiculous obscure secrets to be real, because they were fun and exciting. I think that's a huge part of why this game stuck with me, come to think of it. You know, because of all those little secrets and details that sound like somebody at school made it up. Uh, one time I reset the game, but I didn't get Rossetti. It was his brother, Don, who was super rare, and he wasn't mean at all. He was actually really nice. That was a real conversation I really had with somebody when I was a little kid, and they did not believe me. And the fact that they had every reason not to because Don Rossetti sounds just as made up as Robbie's big dumb super rare fish, that's kind of amazing. Every kid that played this thing came away from it with at least one story about a cool little thing that they found in it. Then there was the kids that really picked the game apart with a fine-toothed comb. I remember a friend of mine had action replay and used cheats to do all sorts of crazy stuff, going out of bounds. I remember when I used it on my file though, I got this error message from KK telling me my data got corrupt and I had to format my memory card, losing everything.
everything. I was devastated that I had to lose my Animal Crossing save. There were no other games I put that much time into as a kid. It was so much worse than losing any other file. It wasn't like getting all of the stars in Mario again or beating Zelda again. No, it was like my town, my villagers, my house, my money, all of which I worked so long for, disappearing. It stung really bad. But if anything, it was a reminder of why I loved Animal Crossing. It was a really satisfying experience working towards everything. There's something really empowering about tackling a giant number like that and then finally feeling like you're in total control of your own life from then on. But as much as I love the original Animal Crossing, there are a lot of archaic little things that make it hard to go back to. The inventory screen, for example, it's really, really clunky by comparison to the newer games, takes forever to organize and sort through your items. Even switching tools takes way longer than it should. I guess it's just one of those series where most installments feel like an upgrade or an overhaul to the same kind of idea, rather than a totally new type of experience like other Nintendo series do. But I mean, a bigger and better Animal Crossing sounded amazing. When I saw those screenshots in Nintendo Power for the very first time, I lost my mind when I saw you could wear glasses and hats now. Just that alone gave me a really good idea of how much freedom you're gonna have in this one. Animal Crossing Wild world. Now here's the big guy for me. I've probably put more time into this game than any other single video game in existence. I wish I could see my playtime for when I was a kid. The hour count must be well into the thousands. Unfortunately, my dumb idiot teenager self sold it when City Folk came out thinking I won't need the old game, I got the new version. God, I wish I didn't do that. My save file was nuts. I had every bug, every fish. I completed the museum. I almost had the damn catalog maxed out. Saying that you've a hundred percented in Animal Crossing Crossing game is something that only a crazy person should be able to say, but I'll tell you, Grade 5 James actually came pretty damn close. Now, of course, a big part of why I had such a ridiculous playtime was because of the game's portability. Every weekend morning, I'd sit my butt on the living room couch, I'd watch Teletoon and YTV while playing my DS. And if I didn't have a new DS game to play at the time, I would always go back to Animal Crossing, because it was a really easy game to half pay attention to while watching television. I could grind for fish and bugs and bells while watching reruns of Fairly Odd Parents, What's With Andy, and etc. I played this game so much that I would consistently have dreams that took place in Animal Crossing. You know how you have a lot of dreams that take place in your kitchen or your house or at your school because that's an environment you spent a lot of time at. But for me, it was the same way with Animal Crossing and that persisted so much that if I happened to have a nightmare, about a third of the time the nightmare would also take place in Animal Crossing. I even had reoccurring nightmares that would happen. I had one all the time where I'd catch a fish and it would just be like a jumble of pixels and glitches and it would crash the game and I thought that was really scary for some reason as a kid. Another one I remember having all the time is the game being pitch black and, except for these torches that are everywhere and I had to like sneak my way to Tom Nook's shop before something in the darkness killed me. But yeah anyway, uh, Wild World is really cool to go back to because despite newer versions having more content and being much more polished, there's still a lot of stuff you can only do in this one. This was one of the very first Nintendo games to try online multiplayer multiplayer, so of course they experimented with online social mechanics. I remember you could write messages in a bottle and they'd show up on other friends' beaches. It was so cool! However, the greater multiplayer was pretty unintuitive. It was so stuck behind friend codes and I didn't really know many other players with the game, so despite how promising it sounded, I never got all that much out of it. It seemed like it was only for players that already knew each other, where I was much more interested in playing with random people in the way that you would in Club Penguin or have a hotel. I thought it was going to be a cool social game like that, but it just kinda wasn't. Then there was Nook Bay. This was a site that was created in light of the game's use of online, where you'd bid your bells and items from other users, just like eBay. Anybody remember this site? I remember I met a dude that I still talk to sometimes on there. I was gonna sell him a matryoshka, but the deal never ended up happening for whatever reason. But despite that, the two of us kept talking, and we hit it off and became friends online. And with New Horizons out, I thought it'd be fitting to finally make that exchange all of these years later. We actually did this. I finally brought the guy his matryoshka and he finally paid me that 100,000 bells. Over a decade later, 
And that Nook Bay deal has finally been made. Uh, shout out Nathan, he downloaded me the James Bond theme from Bear Share because I couldn't figure out how to do it as a kid. Another big new feature of this one was that second screen. It was taken advantage of by always showing the sky. You could get a quick idea of what the weather was like this way, but there were other features as well, like making constellations and shooting down balloon presents and UFOs. Oh my god, remember when they made Gulliver like a space alien for no reason for two games? That was weird. Every game always had a different method of getting the golden axe, but in this one it was especially strange. Uh, this is something a series never did again, but uh, there was a big long secret fetch quest you could stumble upon. You had to buy a red turnip from Joanne, who you'd give to Wendell to get a turban, you'd give the turban to Sahara to get a massage chair, which you'd give to Tortimer to get the scallop, and you'd give the scallop to Pascal to get the golden axe. What a weird thing, they never really tried anything like that again, but it was kind of cool being able to stumble upon it, it felt really secretive and hidden in there, you know? Wild World introduced a lot of new NPCs, like Harriet, Pascal, I love Celeste. I always really, really liked Lyle, though. While he works for the Happy Home Academy in City Folk and onward, he had a much less respectable line of work here, peddling his insurance scam. This little turd would show up every single Saturday trying to get you to buy into it. All it does is give you a hundred bells if you get stung by a bee or got sold a counterfeit painting, which is absolutely worthless and not at all worth your time. It was never confirmed, but I remember a lot of people often suspected Lyle being in cahoots with Crazy Red, running the insurance scam together. I mean, Red sold fake paintings, and Lyle sold a lousy insurance for those paintings. And with the two both sporting a rather shifty personality, it was really fun to draw connections between the two. Oh man, Crazy Red. He was always my favorite NPC ever. There's something cute about the cunning fox being a black market scam artist that cons people out of their money. He's an adorable little scumbag. I love that little jerk. I always really liked how in certain games they'll change the roles the NPCs have. Uh, Copper and Booker went from being policemen to the town gatekeepers. Cap'n hung up the sailor's cap to drive a cab in a couple of games. I really love that intro when you're driving the town in the rain. Oh, it's so cool. Even reset he was given roles outside of his typical job too. But anyway, I could ramble for hours about this game. This is a really weird game to go back to. It is a bigger and better Animal Crossing. There's more fish, more bugs, you have a bigger house, and you have way more options for character customization. But the frame rate and the controls are not good. It runs at like two FPS. Okay, it's closer to like 20 frames per second, but either way, it's not terribly easy on the eyes, especially after being used to how smooth the newer ones run. And those touchscreen controls, while they were great for the inventory, are a really weird way to play the game. Though I do remember using it a lot for fishing because it was just really hard to aim where you're gonna cast with a d-pad instead of a joystick. There was also a number of aesthetic changes they made in Wild World that definitely stuck around. The new sound effects they made would be used for the rest of the series, and the more acoustic direction of the game's soundtrack would become the standard for games to come. The next game in the series was City Folk, and this is where I find a lot of people fell off the series for a little bit. It was hardly even a new game. It was practically just a port of Wild World to the Wii with a handful of new features. I don't know, the whole city thing, it didn't really add all that much to the gameplay, but I did really like all of the quality of life improvements made over Wild World, like being able to cycle tools with a d-pad, that was a godsend. And of course, there were some tacked on motion controls too, you know, every Wii game had to have that, but they were optional and rather unintrusive, like having the option to flick the Wii remote to cast your line instead of pressing the A button. Oh right, they freaking got rid of being able to ready the net to walk slowly with this one, which was a baffling decision that made catching bugs all the less comfortable. Probably to better fit the optional gesture control, but either way, it's still a stupid decision. Well, at least navigating menus with a Wii cursor was, and still is, quite seamless. I prefer the touchscreen like in Wild World and New Leaf, but this is still a quick and handy way to go about it. Also, this is the only Animal Crossing game before New Leaf where I still have my old save file. You can tell I was really into Chrono Trigger at the time for whatever reason. But yeah, there's not really much to say about City Folk. It's just kind of a weird half-step between Wild World and New Leaf, and while I did enjoy it similarly to Wild World, I didn't play it nearly as much, and it was also sort of the game that made me stop and think to myself, if I'm gonna buy another one of these games, they're gonna have to make more substantial changes than this. And I guess my hesitation was met with just that. New Leaf. This was the next step forward, not a half step like before. Instead of just being the same game again, but with more content, they really took a step back and uh, kinda changed a little bit about what it means to be an Animal Crossing game. You are now the mayor, giving you way more control over your town, being able to install bridges and other things to improve it overall. What was once a game about becoming independent and creating your very own home became a game about community.
community, organizing a living space not just for you, but also for others to enjoy as well. And I'd like to imagine that theme of community most certainly bled into the multiplayer, which now had competitive activities for people to engage in. The multiplayer was also made much more accessible and was heavily improved overall. This was the first Animal Crossing game that I actually got a lot out of the multiplayer. It was that weird time in my life where I just wasn't really doing anything for a year. Uh, it was probably a year or two before I began YouTube. It was after I graduated high school, but before I began film school. So it was like that year gap between graduating and starting college. I was also unemployed at the time because I couldn't find a freaking job and then I decided to just wait for school to start that fall instead, so I had no money and I remember my dad giving me 40 bucks for my birthday, so I walked all the way to Walmart to buy the new Animal Crossing. This was sort of an interesting period of my life where I made a lot of internet friends because a lot of my IRL friends at the time were going off to university, so I didn't get to see them as much, and uh, sort of the way I became quite close with a lot of these internet friends was through Animal Crossing. We'd always be playing New Leaf together. And because of that, New Leaf really sticks with me as more of a social experience. I made some of the best friends of my life while playing it. I'm not saying that game is the reason for those budding friendships, but it gave us all something we had in common, and by extension, it gave us something to do together. New Leaf, of course, was also the debut of the fan favorite character, Isabel, uh, named after Bill Trinan's wife, fun fact. I know some people weren't too happy with a new face coming out of nowhere and uh, kind of replacing Tom Nook as a series mascot, even getting into Smash Bros instead of Tom Nook, but I mean, she is a really marketable character, and you could probably boil New Leaf's incredible success at least partially down to the marketing. New Leaf was the game that transformed Animal Crossing from one of Nintendo's Little Brother series into one of their elites, becoming one of their most successful franchises. I guess that's kind of why we got so many spin-offs after New Leaf, but I totally understand the longtime fans that grew up with Tom Nook instead and felt a little bit betrayed by the sudden shift in character focus. She is adorable and lovable and sold millions of copies, but I wouldn't blame anybody who got sick of seeing her everywhere, in the same way that I got very sick of seeing Frozen on every Band-Aid box I walked by, right? New Horizons brought Tom Nook back into the hot seat, which I'm sure had a lot of people happy. Isabel still has a major role, but Tom Nook is once again the head honcho running the show. This dude seriously doesn't get enough credit. I, I know so many people like to make fun of him and clown on him for, uh, he's so greedy, he gives the players insane amounts of debt. How many landlords and debt collectors do you know that give you zero interest, and then tell you you don't even have to pay it off if you don't want to. This guy's a goddamn saint, what are you guys talking about? I'm drowning up to my eyeballs in student debt, if I got a letter saying I didn't have to pay that back if I didn't want to, I'd be ecstatic. And yeah, he forces you into debt in that first game, but this old tanuki has learned to be less pushy in recent years. I think it's just kind of one of those, oh, Navi's annoying kind of recurring jokes that people still say all these years later even though it doesn't necessarily apply anymore. I didn't even realize why his name was Tom Nook until like a year ago. I felt like an idiot not realizing this my whole life. Because, you know, Tom Nook? Ta Nooky, you know, it's, I'm sure I just blew someone's mind out there, but most people are probably like, yes, yes, James, that, yes, that is it, that is why. Animal Crossing's always had a wonderful cast of characters. The reoccurring NPCs are all great. Uh, Blathers has always been a favorite of mine, mostly just because I really like owls, and the way he gets flustered and babbles about everything is really adorable. Bob and Punchy, they were always my two favorite villagers ever since the first game. I was pretty happy to know I'd be able to use their amiibo cards to get them back in New Horizons. Scoop these two up on eBay for about five bucks a pop, like five months ago. Good thing I did it then and not now. What the f and I guess that brings us here. I've been enjoying the absolute hell out of New Horizons. I do have a number of qualms with it, like it, it feels like it takes forever for the game to really open up this time, and getting into the late game stuff just takes too long, like only being able to move one building per day, and it just takes forever. But the amount of freedom you have here is substantially greater than any prior entry, and you have a lot of options from the very beginning. The shop, for example, even the earliest iteration of it will have a pretty solid amount of items each day. Unlike previous games where the shop had barely anything until you upgraded it. It always feels like I have a lot to do, and that promise of creating an entire town of your own is finally fully realized here, with the ability to completely customize your entire town very thoroughly. I started by just giving myself a backyard, and here I am two weeks later with an entire neighborhood full of little critters. It's just so hard not to get sucked into it and watch as your ideas slowly come together. It's so interesting how this game begins way more 
more barren than a usual Animal Crossing, but it ends infinitely more lively. You'll initially spend a lot of your time working towards unlocking some of the most basic of things, like the museum and the shop. But towards the end, everything is so how I want it that I don't even have to use the ladder or vaulting pole anymore. Those tools becoming obsolete because of the progress you've made truly cements that feeling of creating something from nothing. And that Nook Mile system, it is a fantastic way of giving players achievements to work towards. They toyed around with the idea of a second currency in New Leaf uh, after that uh, Welcome Amiibo update with that ticket system, but I don't know, it didn't really feel like that significant of an addition, but incorporating an element like that from the start of development instead of adding it to an already finished game allowed the Mile system to feed into the greater gameplay in a much more meaningful way. Absolutely stunning looking game too, it being the first proper Animal Crossing with HD graphics, they did an outstanding job making the Animal Crossing experience as gorgeous as ever. Even down to the way your island experiences golden hour, oh my god, sunsets and sunrises look amazing in this game. The town feels so much more lively, now that the animals living there all have more tasks they can occupy themselves with, it just feels like stuff's going on, you know? Like, I'm walking through my neighborhood and I see someone eating a snack and I see someone else working out. And the multiplayer, I'm getting so much out of it this time. It seems like every person I know is on that New Horizons game. It's so easy to find people to hang out with this time around, and the streamlined multiplayer mechanics make that so much easier to do. It still does have problems though. The airplane sequence takes way too long and completely interrupts the flow of the game, especially when playing with more than two players. It seems like no matter how streamlined Nintendo can make a series, there's always a number of hurdles they just can't clear. But regardless, I've been enjoying the absolute hell out of it. It's been keeping me busy during these pressing times, and it's bound to keep me busy for the remainder of the year. I'm gonna be playing this for months to come. I always found these games really easy to jump back into at any point, you know, knowing your island or town or whatever is always gonna be there for you to drop by and hang out, and I think that's part of the reason why I'm able to glue myself to these games for so long is, is because of that hanging out nature. It's a game that doesn't really require your utmost attention, you don't have to concentrate on beating a level or fighting a boss, you can take things at your own pace, so it's really easy to play in the background when talking to friends or listening to podcasts or watching movies. And that's just really comfy, you know? In the same way I clung to a Winnie the Pooh plush for its warmth and comfort as a child, I guess I now kinda do the same with Animal Crossing as an adult. But I suppose that warmth and comfort is formed by very different reasons here. It may be cute and cuddly in a very similar fashion, but it's the empowerment of being so in control of a space of your very own. Being able to tackle all of the obstacles of adult life like it's nothing. Video games can empower us, even in ways we never really expected. They can make you feel like a badass, you know, defeating villains or surviving the apocalypse and saving the world, but sometimes it's the lesser exciting, more realistic hurdles in life that we feel the most powerful in overcoming. But I think that's just one of the many reasons people love these games. There's so many details to any given entry, so many nooks and crannies that not every player is going to stumble upon. There's a lot of things I wish I could talk about, but there's just so much of it that mentioning it all would be impossible. But with that said, I hope you guys enjoyed hearing me ramble about the series. I don't know if I really said anything of substance, as this wasn't a usual type of video that I typically do, but yeah, I don't know. I just really love Animal Crossing, so... If you don't mind me, I'm gonna go catch some tarantulas. Bye. Hello, and welcome to the end of the video that is usually here at the end. Uh, thank you so much for watching this one. This video was a little bit more personal than usual, as it was very reflective of my personal experiences, rather than just talking about the game itself. Uh, hey, we have a podcast up on Patreon.com. It's only $1 if you'd like to support the channel. Thanks for watching, thanks for your support, and I'll see you guys very soon. Thank you.